discussion, but there were the two parts of these discussions that keep, kept on recurring. They revolve around the, the issue of trust and financing. So this session that we've got today is all about the trust, it's about the financing, it's about the networking and the cluster and ability to actually engage with the whole industry in some of these discussions. So it gives me a great pleasure. First, I'm going to introduce Graham Clark from the uh, Vancouver International Maritime Centre. Now what we wanted to do here is to get the engagement of a, uh, of a cluster, an innovative driving cluster about the maritime industry to come and participate on this panel. Then we've got um, Edgardo from Akando who's going to introduce the main theme of this discussion. Focus a little bit around the blockchain area as well. And then I'm going to introduce the panellists onto the stage um, to get engaged in this discussion where we discuss areas of what blockchain is, what it means, what the potential is, because I think there's a lot of questions about what it is, but also about the area of finance as well, and the air, what areas we can look at in terms of creating this connectivity and creating the opportunity within the industry. So Graham, please, if I could uh, ask you to come up onto the stage, give your introduction welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Congratulations to you with Fathom and Allison too. We've known you over the years. It's nice to see you here, and nice to see the uh, this production that you've introduced. I think it's very worthwhile. Uh, as Craig mentioned, my name is Graham Clark. I'm president, uh, or chairman, rather, and CEO of the Vancouver International Maritime Center. Uh, CEO is really uh, conferring two important the title on me. The real CEO is our executive director, uh, Katie Arsenietta Stein, who is sitting uh, in front of me, and uh, she has a bunch of business cards, so if you think you want to move your shipping company or your shipping company service provider to Vancouver, a place that will really welcome you, she'll be happy to exchange business cards. And sitting next to her is Yvonne Rankin Constantine, who's our manager of uh, international development. She likewise has business cards, and so do I. So let me just tell you a little bit about Vancouver. It's a very welcoming city. It's a very good quality of life. Um, but it also is the Western entrepot for Canada, which is a resource-dependent open economy. So the governments have supported us as an NGO to go forward and interest ship owners because we mine natural resources, we grow and harvest and we export all of these things to uh, various parts of the world. And of course, the North Pacific Corridor is the one that will grow the most, according to um, DNVGL, anyway, uh, in the next 15 years. And of course, Vancouver is at the eastern terminus of that. So having introduced ourselves, great. Thank you so much. Over to you. Now, if I could, I'll ask um, Eric to come up onto the stage and set the scene for us as we uh, begin to look at what blockchain can do for us and uh, what the financing markets really are going to look for in the future. We've talked a lot about disruption, we've talked a lot about the digital age, we've talked a lot about the opportunities that are emerging, and there's a lot of questions here that are waiting to be answered. I'm not suggesting that Eric's going to answer all of them, but I think he's going to shed some light on some of the potentials that we might see in the future. All yours. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm quite humble when I stand here because um, this is a very big topic and, uh, and uh, a very strategic topic. Uh, and uh, 10 minutes is way too short. Uh, but I hope to give enough uh, to start with so we can have a good dialogue. That's uh, the, the main goal here. Um, I, I did similar speeches like this uh, around about 17, 18 years ago, uh, I even did an MBA in Moscow. Uh, and I said a little bit of, of the same things, that uh, we are going to get new industry ecosystems. And I was totally wrong, because there was something lacking. And I used the word trust. There was no trust in the internet to start with. And I think uh, something is happening here. Um, again, when I was doing this, I was 35 years old uh, last time. Everyone else who was doing this was about 10 years younger than me. If you weren't straight from school, you were, you were nothing. Uh, the difference now is that uh, 
you have a lot of older men that are uh, preaching this harder than I am. Uh, and one of my favorites is, uh, is Klaus Schwab. Uh, he's been an incredible pusher for the whole industrial revolution, but also saying that the blockchain is the center of it. And but all these are technologies. The blockchain, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, they're all technology. It's how you put them together that's going to be the transformation of the revolution. And we see a lot of, lot of companies popping up everywhere, niches that have the solution to the world's problems. Uh, they don't. It's uh, much more uh, difficult than that, uh, and it's much more collaborative. It has to be uh, building standards uh, so that we actually don't have a uh, three million solutions out there, we can actually collaborate in a world of trust. Um, and again, blockchain will also be uh, central in convergence of these. Um, in these last couple of days, there's been a lot of talk around big data uh, and a lot of big talk around Internet of Things. Uh, Internet of Things, uh, if you start getting uh, sensors giving wrong information or uh, someone is hacking into them, you get a problem. You need trust in, down to sensor level. It's not just you and me. Uh, we need trust in everything that's connected to, uh, to the internet. That's a, that's a challenge. Um, the other thing, I'll, I won't go into that, but uh, one of the biggest, uh, another big fan of mine, uh, uh, Bill Gates, he is a fan of blockchain, nothing to do with business or, or us. It's to do with the social bit, that you can actually have a development of the third world much quicker, much more efficient uh, through the use of blockchain, uh, which I think is a uh, very interesting also. Um, now, I am not a shipping expert. Uh, I've worked uh, a, a bit with uh, suppliers to the building uh, on the building side, and, but I've worked a lot with, with your customers. And I think the biggest driver of the change will be your customers, so that even if you don't do anything on the shipping side, you're going to have to do something because you're part of the bigger ecosystem. Uh, and and uh, we talked about financing, uh, we'll get new finding, financing models. I won't talk too much about that because my expertise is more around operating models. Um, but I will, I will give you a little, uh, uh, a little point of view around building, you know. Uh, building of, of ships now, the ships are becoming more and more like hardware and software. That's, uh, but the problem is that this ship is li living for 30 years, which means that it's easy to update software, but it's not easy to update uh, hardware. If this is changing all the time, by the time you start, when you first sold uh, a ship, the changes along the ways in what's inside that hardware is incredible. And even inside a big supplier, this is a supplier I was working with had, uh, had the, uh, well, the total steering, what's it called, uh, on the board, or the, now you know I'm not working in the shipping industry, but uh, uh, we know all the navigation, the automation, uh, the integrated bridge system, very good. Um, there, even within these big companies, the silos within them and the difference of information is, 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 is extremely complex so that their operating costs, which in gain means higher expenses in the products, uh, are, are quite high. And then you go further when you, when you fin finish building the ship, uh, it goes over to customer support uh, and the ship owner is going back to service. But things have changed along the way here. What's actually on that ship? We don't know. You don't know what's on the ship. So you have to go out and find out what's on the ship. And these are things that you can do uh, if you open it up so that, uh, that it's a distributed uh, system where all the suppliers to that ship are actually uh, having a, I call it a, a ship item data management, uh, which, is, uh, which, op which opens it all up. And that is one area that I think blockchain could be uh, could be done. Think, you know, from the other area, I'm not an expert, but uh, through the presentation, think if uh, any of this will uh, affect the other areas. Um, now, what what is what is blockchain? I talked about it. If you go back to uh, the web, the first version, email, that was pretty magical. 
but it took a long time, a lot of protocols before that standardized. Eh? And we're about there now. We're, we're in 1993, 94, maybe, uh, this, uh, maybe a little before, uh, we're in the start of this revolu uh, revolution now of blockchain that we saw, we've seen already, we can't compare, um, and we're moving, uh, we're moving to a, uh, a web, we've gone through web 2.0, uh, we have uh, the smart telephones and, uh, and everything that uh, has popped up on the way, so we have had good development, but now we have, we're going to have a big jump. And blockchain and Web 3.0 are, in my opinion, part of the same, same thing, but you're building stuff on top of it. And what you see and what you read are a lot of blockchain apps that can do amazing things uh, coming out of startup companies. And uh, I believe that the, the main uh, bit of the uh, blockchain will be, will be this, interoperable distributed ecosystems. And that means that you have trust in the ecosystem you work in. Two things are necessary. One is global ID. And that global ID is for, if we're going to be part of this, we, we all need a global ID. Uh, but we also have a ship that needs an ID. We need sensors that need an ID. Everything working in this ecosystem needs an ID. And the other thing that, um, is needed to make a full economic system out of this is uh, is the ability to to uh, to move cash. Cryptocurrencies is what Bitcoin. Maybe most of you have heard of Bitcoin, and but and I think that this is not going to take off before the fiat currencies, the national currencies, and the central banks actually develop their own cryptocurrencies, and they have an interoperable system between that. And that means the end of retail banking, as we see. Then you have a revolution. Now you can put in all your Internet of Things solutions, your uh, artificial intelligence, all adding up here uh, to, to do to be, do a big jump in how business works today and industry works today. And it will be the battle, the collaborative battle. The, the winners. You'll have to work with your competitors. If you don't work with your competitors, you'll see someone flying in from the side. You know, what about DHL? DHL is very good at a lot of these things, but they don't have the ship. But the ship are, starts to get automated. Maybe you don't need that traditional shipping confidence anymore. And there's probably many others. Uh, I think someone mentioned Amazon could be a competitor. I don't know, but, it, but uh, there's a lot of possibilities. Of, so don't think of your competitors today as the ones you've got to fight. I think work will And then it's, um, why is this a good thing? And I think that uh, blockchain does a lot of things. We talked about uh, uh, trust, but, but underneath there, there's the, it's the transparency, the security, traceability, and accountability. And the accountability in this system. That gives you the trust and where you're getting your value is because it's frictionless. All the middlemen, all the all the extra things that are necessary to to get this energy to work today will be not needed in the future. Now that future is a long journey, but uh, it'll come. Now, just uh, uh, I don't want to use too many examples because there's a lot out there. But uh, Mash, I think, has been. He's done, done the, the, the sector a, a favor by jumping in early. And I think when Max jumped in with IBM, uh, a lot of people woke up. I know this company I work with where they now have, within three months, have a chief digital officer and a chief transformation officer. Now this has to do something with what's coming. Very exciting. And the other thing is, uh, is when you start working more with the blockchain, you can start, uh, this is going to become autonomous. Eh? Smart contracts are incredibly interesting because it, it'll take away everything that is, can be automated. Uh, and you can build logic into it and already 
Today they've developed something called a digital uh, autonomous organization. And that's an organization that uh, doesn't have any CEO. Sorry, Graham, no CEO there. <laughs> and it, it, it is run by the owners by, 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 by voting. And then it does, uh, and, and then this is way too early, but it, 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 it might come in a hundred years. Uh, we're moving in, that's a little scary. We discussed that a little at the start, where it's going, but I don't think we're going to take that here. I think we'll like to take a five-year perspective on it. A little on finance. Um, this uh, one uh, the, uh, DAO, uh, it raised $150 million in uh, a few weeks um, with 20,000 people. Now. A lot of discussions have been on, you know, investing into to new technology and chips. We don't have the money, um, but there are people out there willing to take that risk uh, as a stake in ownership. Uh, so there might be many possibilities. This year is actually uh, investing money. And this is a Ether wallet. This is uh, one of the two big Ethers of Bitcoin. Um, when you move into this uh, Ether world, um, you can. Uh, if you, you, you can crowdfund, so you get get the money in, and you can take it out in, in the traditional world. Today, in the future, you'll be in here. When the fiat currencies come, you'll you'll see that this money out here is the traditional fiat money. This is cryptocurrency. The movement will go from there to there. Eventually, you'll only be working in uh, in this. North. This is kind of a matrix. In the financial world, uh, if you can, and this makes it difficult because you have to, it's, a, it's a change in mindset. And we're running out. Of just a, just one last picture, you know. Um, this can go many ways. If you only look at yourself, you're not going to win. If you don't look at your region, some other region is going to uh, to win. What we see in th this area of blockchain, uh, uh, China and Asia uh, are moving incredibly fast. China had a whole different technology level to begin with, uh, and they're using this to leapfrog uh, a lot of... All Alibaba, Tencent and all these are investing a lot of money into this. Uh, the Chinese government has huge programs around blockchain. In Norway, there's nothing. Nothing. And that's pretty amazing, you know. This here is uh, this is the future, and, uh, and and we have to work together if we're going to do it. And one of the things uh, we're telling our clients that at least start with some strategic insight. You know, understanding it. Don't just look at some blockchain apps, but you can start with you can do both. But 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 try to understand where this is leading. First. If I could ask our other panelists now to come up and join us, we have um, Eric Garner, of course, just given an introduction into um, what blockchain is. And the word that Eric kept on using over and over again, I don't know how many times, was trust. Seems to be a key aspect of what we're talking about here. On the panel, we have Salman Parman, Parman from Inspire Invest. So I would call you sort of like a he was talking about crowdfunding, about new ways of getting finance, and that if you're a company that's got a lot of um, investments in new technologies, um, Inspire Invests is uh, a backer of Zen, Zero Emission Mobility or Zero Emission Maritime, and some of the battery packs and battery systems, of course. Mark Clintworth is from the European um, Investment Bank and has been looking at, uh, asked him to do a bit of homework before today, to look at what we're talking about there from, that, from the EIB's perspective. Because one of the aspects that we're looking at here is in the development of trade finance and the ability when it comes to ship finance as well, what models we've got there. Um, Inga, if you were on one of the earlier panels uh, yesterday, is from uh, Bill Wilhelmsen. Eric alluded to a chief digital officer. This is the man. This is the chief digital officer who's been brought in recently into Bill Wilhelmsen to um, enable some of this to change, I imagine. So my first question, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to go to the finances here because 
you ended on sort of the fiat currency and the um, digitalization of currency and the trust factor. I think we're going to go back and back to this trust factor. Mark, if I can, could you start by telling me how you see this? Because you've got an area, you, you're involving in um, the financing of large assets where you've got a number of different players. So how do you see these changes impacting what has hitherto been a very traditional financing model within the shipping industry? Thanks, Craig. Um, I think I'd like you to sort of put your minds into the future where all of this works, try very hard, and everything's sorted as regards regulatory issues, trust issues, security, and so on and so forth. So let's go into this fantasy world where we have blockchain, if you like. We have the distributed ledger technology. It's secure. We're using it. And what kind of issues are finances looking at? And how are they looking at using, these, uh, using this technology as a base? A base for what? Well, from our side, it would be a base for removing um, risk, for risk management and absorption, particularly within the shipping sector, it would be for the construction and operation phases. And as Eric so nicely alluded to and uh, touched on, smart contracts would be beginning to be the base of this. And we look at smart contracts, for example, to start issuing, you know, look, looking at things like covenant tracking, looking at loan to value, looking at uh, operational market risk tracking on a real-time basis. So you can imagine a situation where I don't have to go to a broker two, three times a year to have your vessel valued. I know the value of your vessel at any moment I want to take it. And I'm going to have a flag in the contract, the smart contract, which says loans of value exceeded. Red flag. Or there's a maintenance issue. We're tracking your vessel or your fleet on a maintenance side. We get that track. So we've got a handle on our contract on a real-time basis. That's the potential, for example, that smart contracts and distributed electric technology can bring. You know, we've got issues of corporate finance and corporate structure, which are always issues when lending. You know, we've got centralized ownership data we can have on the blockchain. We've got uh, contracts held within the blockchain. Um, so therefore, we can offer lower risk pricing. Therefore, we can widen our lending to even the, you know, the, the problematic small and medium-sized enterprises and ship owners that we have at the moment. Are you saying that this could be a facilitator for not easier finance, but the trust element will make, will make it um, more available for companies that at the moment may have some difficulties in getting the finance? That is precisely what I'm saying, exactly. Because at the moment, the way we handle financing for SMEs and small ship owners is very inefficient. And it's very inefficient because one of resources in particular, well, this gets rid of all of the third parties, potentially. We have a distributed third party base, yeah. no single ownership. And this so, is so one of the things. When you see, Eric mentioned crowdfunding. Do you think you would ever see a crowdfunded vessel? I said fantasy, but let's wait. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, you're taking it too far. Yeah. But if eventually, those principles will come into play more and more. So in, in fact, you know, I've got clients I've been speaking to who've got great ideas. And they've got great ideas for vessels, they've got a great, you know, for sustainable vessels. They just need the 50% of the finance that the EIB can't provide. So we sort of try and help them to find commercial, you know, venture capital, private equity. That will all become easier and easier. So you, in that you, sense, you find that I'm going to hang out to, um, just from Inspire Invest as a sort of, as a sort of no, novel is probably the wrong word, but a, a sort of startup that's looking for unique solutions and you came in with a sort of a financial model. Are you finding the trust elements will be in a beneficial part of this for you in the future? Please work. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, if we think about it, um, what was said previously, if you think about blockchain itself, I mean, crowdsourcing has been around for a few years now and been operating very successfully without the blockchain. And that's sort of one problem that, or, or one solution that comes into the shipping world, or maybe not. But I think what the blockchain solves specifically is this trust issue. So it's basically um, the way Bitcoin took off is that somebody found a very an elegant technological solution to solve an age-old mathematical problem, which is a Byzantine general's problem, to be able to have up different people communicate without a central authority. Right, so if blockchain is going to disrupt 
anything in the shipping world or outside the shipping world. It will be where a central authority is taken out. So Bitcoin, the central authority, the central bank, that goes away and people can, can manage the currencies of the central authority. So the question is, how can, you know, what central authorities in the shipping world would be taken out of the picture in a new distributed world where different players can trust each other without, um, uh, without having that middle person. So there's, no, there's, there's no broken so middleman. There's no trust middleman. It, that, there's that, no need for it. Yeah. Yeah. In, Inga, how, what do you see the potential as? You've come into Little Hillhampton um, over the last few months and you're starting to look at what the opportunities are from the ship owner, operator, and uh, that sort of service provider side of the company yeah. as well. What are your take on how this is going to be an enabler for what's going on? Yeah, so we have spent uh, last months talking with a lot of uh, different players in the market, uh, and, and that's what we we see that we need to facilitate more uh, interaction between all these uh, parties in the in the value chain, and um, uh, we are also seeing this in context of uh, access to new digital platforms uh, such as uh, Veracity from DMGL, etc. So when we have access to this data, and then we are going to exchange this data. Blockchain could be an enabler to to have that trust. So we uh, introduced uh, uh, our own initi initiative together with uh, different partners such as uh, Arker and DMVGL, Maritime Innovation Lab, where we are inviting in uh, players uh, and now last uh, IBM uh, to be part of uh, uh, a discussion, but also trying to get down to the, the some more concrete things, start pilots, and start to figure out how we're going to work together. I think we, we, we as, a, as a customer uh, can facilitate with partners uh, to drive this in a, in a much higher speed. So the, 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 it's an open house, isn't it, in terms of what blockchain has the potential to do here. It's, a, it's an enabler, it's a trust creator. From, from, the, from, from a maritime cluster perspective, Graham, when you see ship owners and the, uh, the various players coming together. Do you think this is going to be an enabler for a maritime cluster to grow? Or is it going to remove that physical presence that you need when it comes to that? I'm, I'm slightly provocative maybe, but what is going to be the, um, the, the value of having organisations around, organ around one physical location? The, the second um, quadrant of the arc of the introduction of blockchains is locality. Uh, I mean, the Eric made reference to TCP/IP technology, which actually started in 1972. It took until the late 90s before it was actually working. The initial emails that people got were intranet emails from inside their corporation. Uh, Peer-to-peer -peer didn't happen until TCP/IP came along. So, when you've got corporations that supply services to shipping companies, for instance, uh, the fact that they're in close proximity means that the excitability of the concept is more likely when you're closely proximate. So, the cluster effect actually is magnified by the presence of something like uh, a blockchain, which is. I would argue is not is not disruptive as much as it is, uh, and I'm quoting from a, a Harvard um, a business review article that I read in preparation for coming here. Because, like so many of us, I didn't re my introduction to blockchains was my grandson who had Bitcoin, and so you know those of us who have been there, done that, have to have a reawakening. And it was pretty obvious to me that. Um, uh, that uh, blockchain technology is something that is coming, but it is foundational. It's, it isn't going to disrupt the trajectory of what's already in play, it's going to replace it. And in doing so, it's going to cause a lot of disruption at that point, uh, because it's not going to enable the productivity of people the way the first industrial revolution did. It's going to replace the people. And that's going to be a really big issue, but that's for later in the conversation. Is that something you would agree with, Eric, in terms of the evolution? Yeah. Use the microphone. Question. Um, you know, Bill Gates said that, uh, I think that's the last quote, I think yeah. you used that uh, a little earlier, that uh, 
we underestimate in, um, in uh, overestimate in one year and underestimate in ten years. And I think in a ten year perspective, we're going to see, yeah, uh, it's going to be quite different. Just look at your iPhone. You know, that's that's now ten years. We're getting used to it, but it, it totally changed the way we all work. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, and that. But we look back and we we kind of we don't realize it. But now it's going to hit industry because industry is you know. It hasn't changed that much, you know, over the years. You know, what about the sort of the, the regional differences here? We talk about this technology. We talk about digital. It's um, you know, in Norway and Sweden and the Nordics, they are what I might call sort of digital pioneers. But Asian countries, perhaps, they're skipping some of that evolution. They're going straight to the to the chase now. That some of the, some of those platforms and those opportunities are already there. Are we going to see a two-tier world here emerge? particularly in the shipping industry, where we have some parts, some geographies engaged in the digitalization of the industry, engaged with blockchain, and other parts of the industry that are more um, utilizing today's more traditional financing models. Well, I don't think you can survive. I think it, you'll, you'll have laggers, uh, and if you lag too much, you go out of business. Uh, that's, uh, that's what's happened in every, uh, every round we have. So I don't think no, anyone's going to be working, uh, you know, when you get, start getting autonomous ships out there, we don't have that. Yeah. Uh, that that will come. Some yeah. will survive, some won't. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Mark? In terms of the sort of ship finance perspective, that um, it will it needs to happen on a sort of global platform level, not sort of common standard necessarily, but the whole industry needs to start evolving blockchain and digital solutions, not one region or the other. Certainly not regional. But the uptake the uptake will be busy, that's for sure. At the beginning. But as soon as uh, as soon as they latch on, I mean, banks are not slow to, uh, to to on the, on the uptake when it comes to profit, like anyone else. So and what, what about what about things like um, guarantees? How would, would they be impacted by the sort of? You know, at the, at the end of the day, whatever goes on the balance sheet goes on the balance sheet. Whether it be a guarantee, it's still a provision. At the end of the day, it's still money, and it operates in, this, in exactly the same way. Do you find things that are? Do you think things are going to be happening a lot? Quicker, the decisions are going to be made quicker. Decisions will obviously be made quicker at the uh, eventually, again, yeah. we're talking about the future, but it will definitely be made quicker. Yeah. And velocity is all part. Yeah. You know, you see it everywhere when you look at the blockchain. And also from your perspective as well, if things happen quicker, and I'm particularly interested here because when you're, when you're a, a startup or whether you're um, a venture capitalist or an organization like that, I've got this idea that things happen because people get to know each other. There's that, I know you, you've got a great idea, I've learned to understand your passion for that project, marine batteries for example, I'm going to invest in you, you know, Dragon's Den kind of style. But if you're going through blockchain, you're taking that gut feeling out of it. Yeah, and I think things can move very quickly in, in a couple of different ways. One, as Eric mentioned, there's already new blockchains that are coming out and raising 20, 30, 100 million dollars just like that. Um, and the 20,000 people that are investing in them don't necessarily know each other, right? And so this crowdsource aspect is, is very important, but also the evolution that you have around blockchain, especially with, with chains like Ethereum, where you have these smart contracts that were also mentioned, means that you can have certain automated and programmable um, transactions that are booked into the blockchain, and because they're programmable, they're going to just move very fast. Now, what those are um, is, is less clear. And we can have ideas, I think, uh, mentioned again, sort of the iPhone, where 10 years ago the iPhone came out, and, uh, and the first, first apps on the iPhone were YouTube and Safari, and you know, you're like, well, I'm going to use the same as a PC, and then it takes a few years, and then somebody comes out with Uber that really takes advantage of it. And my, my favorite historical quote, if you allow me, is sort of like, when Edison created the phonograph, I think his, his view was that people are going to use it to actually listen to religious sermons. He didn't even think about music. So when a new technology comes out, we're limited by our imagination about what it can be used for. And I think everybody's very excited about blockchain, and we can think about how it can disrupt the shipping uh, value chain, for example, but you're probably going to have some small effort somewhere that is going to come and tackle a part of it and suddenly realize that this is a great area to actually disrupt and remove the middleman and 
we can talk about it, but it's probably going to be, you know, out of 100 experiments, two of those that are come out and be successful and suddenly take over and scale in the same way that a Facebook did, because all of these blockchains are about networks as well, so whether it comes from uh, Asia or somewhere else, they're going to have huge network effects and suddenly be world dominated effectively. You mentioned an interesting word there, that's imagination. You know, it's, there's imagination, there's limits that. You come in from outside the industry. Do you think this is an industry that is imaginative, that can really grasp some of the opportunities that are emerging here, whether it be the blockchain or even some of these other digital solutions? Yeah, that's, I mean, just to repeat myself, the, the, our initiative to kind of get these startups or larger companies uh, together, and, and also the, the clusters, the maritime clusters, and, and obviously the governments have a, playing a very important role. And if you look at the, the industrial revolutions that we have had, uh, they have all been a result of authorities have been regulating uh, and then you will see that uh, that change so we need that gravity from many directions coming and uh, and then of course the technology itself is evolving so we see now it's more uh, applicable for the use of industrial IoT uh, enabling now asset management enabling us to to really uh, build it into our value chains where we can see that it has an impact on uh, the assets that we are owning and maybe are uh, not owning because the, there is a middleman that is willing to take uh, risk and it can have an impact for uh, insurance. So it's, it's a, it has so many different uh, opportunities and I think that we need to stimulate that uh, through uh, helping uh, these companies uh, work together with us. And that's why we have the initiative of the, the Maritime Innovation Lab. I'm just going to go to Mark, got a comment I think that. But I'm going to go back to this point I wanted to raise with you there, Ingo. Yes, you've hit on a very important point, which is the, uh, the principal agent problem. And the principal agent problem of um, asymmetric information, moral hazard, and so on and so forth, all surrounding that. And this is exactly what that's aimed at, removing those issues, which mm -hmm. are very costly and timely. Would you also see this happening internally within a company? Bill Billamson is quite a large organisation with many different parts. To the, to the whole. Yeah, our ultimate goal is to, to break the silence and enable uh, also trust between our own companies within the group where they can exchange data and, uh, and of, of course be able to, to exchange data with, with our partners. So I see that uh, blockchain is, is an enabler for that, but it, ne it needs to be seen in the context of, of having access to uh, data that's al already been validated. So, uh, because then when you have the data that's validated, you want it to be exchanged in a secure way, and that's where blockchain is, is playing an important role. And it, and it ends up being exchanged in a way that is trusted, going back to the trust. Yeah, you exactly. know, it's being done in a, in a trusted way. Graham, in terms of the, the trust and the various different players that you, you see, particularly in a sort of maritime cluster, um, you know, any geographical cluster where you've got a lot of different, different factors, is it not going to be a case that you're going to find different blockchains? We talk about blockchain. So it's... I think some people consider, when I first came across blockchain, I thought it was a, a, a big thing. Do you know what I mean? I, I know it's all digital and we can't really see it, but I thought it was like it was a, a big banking system, it was a heavy software-based thing. But we're talking about blockchain being used in many different ways and many different blockchains, within, even within one organization. I imagine you can have many different blockchains. But when it comes to that cluster idea of having, and then having all those blockchains within a cluster, creating something more, perhaps something more dynamic, I think, yeah. I think, I think the application of um, blockchains is going to be more broad than what's just been discussed here. It's going to apply not just to crowdfunding and to um, supply chain management, things that you would logically think it would be applied to, but I think it's going to apply to government too. There was an interesting article uh, uh, in the Cato Institute by um, Jonathan Mickenway, who's a contributor to The Economist. He said that uh, the American Congress today is favored less than uh, King George III was in 1776. That's how dysfunctional government has become, because of a lack of trust. And I think that blockchain technology is it's going to be ubiquitous when it finally comes. There's going to be a lot of resistance to it, and when it comes, it's going to replace everything. Eric. 
speak about government. The areas government will be the uh, main driver of blockchain. Uh, we see already uh, Dubai. Uh, Dubai says that within 2020 we are the first blockchain government with the country. Everything, all the documents will be on the blockchain. Full trust and, and full open. Uh, in that 2020, is three years, it's not a long time. And so, uh, so I think uh, a lot of the countries that, uh, like I said, I think if uh, the Scandinavian countries opened up the government, said that we will have a, a blockchain strategy in place very quickly. We'll have a crypto cryptocurrency and not in second. Uh, you will see the development in Scandinavia take off. Uh, but there is some sort of resistance to jumping in. I think they're going to be slow followers instead of fast. But in China, this year, the, the prediction is that they will have a cryptocurrency. And that is the biggest, uh, second biggest economy in the world. When they do that, things will have to explode because the competitive advantage within the Chinese market will, uh, will take off. It'll be interesting. You mentioned the sort of a, the slow take-up, or some organisations may be slower than, than others. Come back to your comment, Mark, where you said that uh, you could have a blockchain that actually has a sort of a red flag. So a ship owner has uh, a red flag come up when they don't meet a covenant, when the, when this when the asset isn't being as maintained. As it, I can imagine some ship owners going, "Not, not for me. I don't want that." Good. What do you mean? Good? Well, but that's just it. I mean, it was not meant, where, where is blockchain sort of removed some of the uh, um, adds to the democracy? It takes away some of the some of the secrecy. From it. And you know, we're going to have uh, your machine learning tools out there more and more and more, keeping track of every move we make, whether you like it or not. And that information will have to be out there, otherwise you won't get access to the financing that you need. So I mean, that so means the, the banks will turn around and say, well, "This is one of our prerequisites." You need to be engaged with this because that way we know we trust you. There you go. And that way we price you in rather than out yeah. with, our, with our risk pricing. So, I mean, yeah, there, there, there are, don't forget, this, there's, there's privacy issues to be handled as well. Yeah. Private blockchains and so on and so forth. We have to, will have to be developed on this. And, that, and confidentiality will have to be the main concern. So, yeah, within that realm, yes, if you want the finance, back in, in the times we're discussing here, you will have to be a lot more open and transparent. And that is the problem, as we all know, within this industry. Transparency. Inga, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a very good point, that we will see that the players in the market that are serious, uh, they want currency. They want to be open. And uh, they have nothing to hide. And on the contrary, they want to show um, how well they're operating. And uh, obviously, blockchain is uh, an, an enabler for uh, getting that trust in place, and uh, and it will impact um, insurance. It will impact um, the cost of transactions. So we, we see that uh, this is just uh, a great opportunity for the serious companies in the, in, in this industry, but it's also in many other industries. But do you also see your customers, the the, the customers of the ship owner, the you know, if or Bill Wilhelmsen who's transporting uh, vehicles. So the, the Toyotas and Ford, they'll be engaged in this and they'll be wanting to deal and trade that sort of trade finance they got for imports and exports will be doing this. They'll be turning to the shippers and the ship owners and saying, right, we need you to be on this because this is the way we're doing our business now. Yeah, exactly. And, and you can imagine that uh, the owner of the, the cars, that may, might change uh, even in, in transport, that uh, uh, because of the trust is enabled, um, the ownership of, of uh, the vehicles themselves could be exchanged in a secure uh, and efficient way. So you've got that transparency where you need the transparency with the bodies, the parties that need to have the transparency, while having the trust, while having the security that the information is actually going where it should mm. be going. I mean, is this really sort of the, one of the true disruptive breakthroughs in the shipping industry, do you think, Eric? I'm no expert in shipping, but uh, I would I try to uh, compare it a little bit to the to the automotive industry. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think I think when you break down some of these things here, you you can you can change totally. I just uh, 
I just read, uh, you can say Toyota, uh, you mentioned Toyota. Toyota is now putting their whole development of their autonomous cars and, and, and now on, on the blockchain. Because they say that we cannot guarantee the safety of our cars if we can't, uh, if those sensors uh, are not secure. So you need, you know, and a lot to do with the big data we discussed. If we don't have that security, uh, and when it comes to privacy, that is that 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 depends on how you build up your blockchain. Uh, you know, you're also talking about patient information on the blockchain. Yeah, that's not open to everybody, but it's the uh, transaction that is open to those who need it. And, and uh, so what 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 is, what is the sort of everybody sort of like talking sort of said positively here about blockchain, but is there not the sort of risk issue? I mean, can it be hacked? Can it be broken? Can it be manipulated? You mentioned that everything is going to have an ID. Every sensor, every person, every ship, every thing will have its unique ID. That, for me, if somebody can get access to that, is a huge risk. But that, that's, it is like that today. You can't have even other things if you don't have the ID of the sensor because then you can't use the information. Now it's individual companies you can go to and you can uh, buy solutions. That is, again, then you're trusting someone to, uh, to have the security on, on that when we know that it's easy to hack into today's technology. Uh, blockchain is proven through Bitcoin that uh, you can't do that and that's the only technology out there and when that said this technology is underdeveloped you know the final word is said around what this is going to be like in five years but there's tremendous development and there's tremendous now uh, focus on standardization so that you will end up you, you will be talking about blockchain in five ten years it's like the internet it's there and you work with it Right? We're just in a phase now where blockchain is, is something new. It will just be a part of the infrastructure. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Eric, Inga, Graham, and Simon. Thank you very much for your input today. Thank you.